So ladies and gentlemen and Bat family out there, the DCU Batman movie, The Brave and the Bold. Let's talk about it because I haven't really spoken about what can really make up this movie. So this video isn't necessarily me saying exactly what I think is going to happen in scene one minute seven of The Brave and the Bold movie but more of an envisioning from my perspective of how certain aspects of this new Batman can be realized in James Gunn's DCU and planned Brave and the Bold movie. Because after all, we can't forget that the stage in where Bruce Wayne is at with his vigilante career, with what has been teased already, and just overall in a DCU where heroes exist and have existed, what does this mean for Batman's potential when we visit a take where he's this far into his career with his son, popping into his life. So I hope you all go on to enjoy this video. If you do, leave me a like on it. I think I can make a part two out of this because there's plenty of other things I want to tackle that I don't think I'm going to be able to get to in today's video because you know me, I, I can talk quite a bit. It's in the channel name, uh, but, but let's get right into this. So first of all, something that is discussed quite a bit, and I know plenty of you out there will know exactly what I mean by this. Ever since the announcement of the DCU's Batman, one of the biggest topics is how old will this Batman be? What well, what is his age? Now, yes, I, I do agree that this is something to be considered. Sometimes people wonder why does his age matter so much? And I get what they mean. It, it kind of both does and doesn't matter in a way. And I'll explain that in just a second. Firstly, the reason as to why fans, including myself, wonder about Batman's age is because it matters to some degree, given that with the DCU's Batman, and of course, his age mirrors the progression of his Batman career, especially with the premise for the Brave and the Bold giving us a ballpark of where he is likely at. So when you read into this, sure, there are certain things that you can take into account of what James Gunn has said before, such as him stating that Superman will be David Cronenworth's age. So by the time they film Superman Legacy, David Cronenworth will be 31 years old. I point this out as well because James Gunn has previously said when responding to fans loosely about ages, that Batman might, might be a couple of years older than Superman in the DCU. And I know some people out there will take James Gunn saying that, you know, a couple as, as a fact, as in Batman will be 33 in the DCU, no ifs, no buts there. But I'm just going to go ahead and say that I, I really don't think that will be the case, which will be funny if I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But let me get into why I don't think he will literally be a couple of years older than Superman. So first of all, with that, I wouldn't take what James Gunn says here so literally. For example, as he continued to answer the age question in relation to Batman in the DCU, it's not the only reply he's given. In one of the more recent updates, he's now saying, we haven't cast him yet. So we have no clue. So do you see what I mean there? Especially with that update in conjunction with what I'm saying in this video, my advice would be when viewing the DCU Batman to not completely rule out the casting of actors who are even into their 40s of whom can pull off the look of a character who's younger than they are in real life. Another reason why I wanted to start off this video talking about the age of Batman in the DCU is because it's important to also consider that Damian Wayne, Batman's son, is entering his life and James Gunn and Pierce Safran have acknowledged and this is very important as well that there will be a bat family of some size that Bruce has built throughout his crime fighting years. Peter Safran said as follows, this is going to feature other members of the extended Bat family, just because we feel like they've been left out of the Batman stories in theater for far too long. To me, with regards to this topic, that speaks volumes. So assuming this Batman, for now, returned to Gotham at around 25 years old in the DCU and shortly afterwards became Batman around 26 maybe, it seems very likely that we'll be seeing, in my opinion, a year 10 to 12 Bruce Wayne slash Batman. And this would put Bruce at least in his mid 30s, at least. Now, to be fair, something I do wanna say is that ages in the comics have been something that has been fairly fluid when it comes to Bruce Wayne or other characters out there, origins, sidekicks. And we know that when things are adapted into live action, it's no different. One of my most famous sayings on this channel throughout the years is adaptations 
aren't copy and paste. So therefore, to those of you who are completely disagreeing with me right now, I, I can't deny or disregard the idea that if they actually do want a much younger Batman by the time he's training Tim Drake with Damien coming along in the movie, they could make a change in typical continuity and canon where Bruce becomes Batman much younger, maybe even in his early, early 20s. Now, I don't really know about that. Technically, I can't argue with it, but it's just odd because Bruce really does normally become Batman at around 26, so to imagine like a 21-year-old, 20-year-old Bruce Wayne Batman, eh, I don't know, I'd love to know your thoughts on that. They could do another approach here, such as somewhat of a new 52 type thing where Batman had his Robins after like only five years, and where the Bat family all started off a bit older and trained for a much lesser amount of time. So therefore, again, those of you who quite literally do want the Bruce Wayne in the DCU to be two years older than Superman, David Corrin sweat Superman, so 33, you could maybe condense it down to that with approaches like that. But personally to me, and let me know if you agree or disagree, I think that Bruce Wayne, Batman in the DCU being 36 to 38 years old in the canon is more of a compromising age when taking everything into account. Bottom line, guys, who knows exactly how they're going to adapt the chronology of the Robins, how they will reflect that onto Bruce's age from the comics or not. Again, it's never copy and paste. You guys should know this by now. There will be some innovative things done there to make things work to their own desires. I mean, if you really, like, if you really wanted to adapt the Bat family more accurately, Bruce would really be in his 40s, to be honest, if he wanted more wiggle room in there with multiple Bat family members, which is why, once again, I, I wouldn't actually even rule out mid 40s or so actors playing a Bruce Wayne Batman who is around actually in universe 37 to 42. Just never say never. Some of you may be like, are you crazy? Batman's obviously going to be like 34. Just don't rule it out. Another thing that was pointed out to me a while ago when contemplating all of this is that even if an older actor, and, and I'm not saying super old, I'm talking like 45, 46 or something like that. So just an older actor for Bruce Wayne. Let's just say that kind of actor is cast as the DCU Batman. They might not even acknowledge age, if at all. So long as the actor looks the part, and particularly with Batman, given the stage of where he's at in his life and what's being described to us, the, the story they're tackling and basing this on with Batman and Damian Wayne from Grant Morrison's comic book run. So long as he's not like super young to where that just doesn't really make sense and wouldn't have all of that, nor super old, so also that would just be a bit strange. It could just, again, bottom line, not really be focused on that much. Which brings me to the next part of this video and why I said all of that, why I started off with age and this need to kind of find an actor to reflect an experienced Bruce Wayne given the Grant Morrison storyline that it's based off. This movie will feature Batman, not only Batman, obviously, but also his son, Damian Wayne. As Robin, is described here, is a little son of a bitch, Bill's gun, assassin murderer who Batman takes on, who is Batman's actual son that he doesn't know exists for the first eight to ten years of his life. It's a strange father and son story about the two of them, and based on Grant Morrison's run of the Batman. Now, when Gunn says, this is another thing I need to say there, when he says that it's based on Grant Morrison's run of Batman, I do also advise not taking that so literally as well. Sure, there'll be inspirations and ideas and perhaps overall kind of influences there, but not everything copy and pasted. I know I keep hammering that in, but some people really do think, oh, well, if it's based off of it, this will be happening, that will be happening. So for those of you who aren't as familiar with Grant Morrison's run of Batman, his run of Batman looks at a Batman who's, I would say, like, not quite at the tip, tip top of his career, but a way to put it is that he's fairly accomplished and very, very seasoned. Again, as per what I envision with this DCU Batman Brave and a Bold movie. As you would expect with Damian Wayne coming along and obviously with many more adventures left to go. The cool thing about Morrison's Batman being adapted, or should I say not so straight up adapted, but inspiring the brave and a bold story in the DCU, is that we know the DCU is going to embrace the fantastical universe. This isn't going to be like Matt Reeves's Batman or Nolan's Batman, where there's certain aspects of realism put in there. You're going to have all kinds of comic book pages ripped to life. And again, that is what Grant Morrison doesn't shy away from. He 
goes to this nice blend of the far reaches of superhero fantastical, yet also merged with a slice of kind of modern Batman that you would also want in there as well. Which is why so many people look to this run as something pretty spectacular with the vision that Morrison had, attaching all of those continuities together in one way or another. Now when I say not to take Gunn's comment of based on Grant Morrison's run so literally, what I mean by this is I don't think we're going to see Bruce go on to be taken out by Dark Side's Omega Beams or another popular talking point since this DCU announcement was people referring to Grayson taking up the mantle of Batman since that's what happened and he took Damien on as his Robin. For people to then be like, well, this means the DCU Batman's going to be Dick Grayson. But just in case you don't know that that's not the case, Gunn has come out more than once saying, nope, DCU Batman is Bruce Wayne. I also don't think we're going to then get a return of Bruce Wayne's storyline where he got pulled through time to then freaking Damian Wayne eventually dying. Like things get pretty crazy in Grant Morrison's Batman run and obviously all of that wouldn't happen in one film anyway but the key thing here is just it's inspired and based on it. But when you actually bring it into live action, that's where they're gonna kind of play around with some ideas. But the fact that they are drawing from the energy and flavor and tone and just ideas from Grant Morrison's Batman run really does make me pretty damn excited because Morrison's Batman is a great mold to rip a variety of ideas from because Batman by that point has already trained as we've already been over several Robins and has had many many run-ins with his rogues gallery that led them to being locked up in Arkham albeit that of course they'll always break out again but that isn't so much the main focusing point with this story in the DCU. Batman's new challenge in this movie is being a parent. Now, I'm not saying that we're not going to see cool rogues gallery stuff in the DCU, for we know we could get a villain or two in this movie for Batman and Damien to take on. But the main theme will be tackling a part of Bruce that he hasn't really, and I know some of you will be like, but what about Robin, the father figure there? But you know what I mean. This is his biological son. This is really what it's all about. And I know some people are apprehensive about this movie, Movie for one reason or another, whether you love Andy Muschietti, you may have a lot of excitement for it, or if you've seen The Flash, or you might not like some of his other movies, you might be like, oh, this is my favorite character. Is Andy, you know, really going to be handling this? Regardless, the premise for me and for a lot of fans is really exciting because Gunn's plans for the Brave and the Bold movie and the fact that he chose Batman to start off there, other than, you know, this whole DC universe is in general hitting the ground running with a lot of characters already a few years into their career. Almost, I guess you could say, New 52 like there, just with how that comic book run starts with characters and superheroes five years off into their career. If executed well, this part of Batman is just so fascinating as much as really a lot of other psychological dives that we take into the character because this one most certainly is a psychological freaking trip that Batman needs to go on. Since the movie will go into the exploration of due to the very thing that made Batman who he is from that of Bruce's parents' death for his drive to be this vigilante, that very thing has also made him struggle so immensely with his ability to connect in any kind of sentimental relationship. Now, I know there's some debate about that, but let's not pretend that it isn't um, difficult for him. Then, let alone that ripple effect can also make him quite a distant father and often detached from forming a real sense of bond. Having moments here and there, I won't deny that, where you may be like, but what about this story with Dick Grayson? I'm not denying that there hasn't been moments where Bruce has been like, oh, okay, yeah, that was a nice fathery kind of moment. But half the time, or if not three quarters of the time, he's never really fully vulnerable as a father should be because he's just so knee deep into Batman, even after years and years of developing as a character in of himself. That's the one thing that is always a bit, to be quite frank, shitty at times. And this is one really cool aspect that the movie could touch on in other areas, even outside of Damian Wayne and Batman, for example references with his prior Robins, such as Dick Grayson going off on his own in the DCU and becoming Nightwing. But for the first time in a long while, with the arrival of Damien at his door, this can help introduce a spark in Bruce that he didn't 
even necessarily know that he was capable of harnessing. Or at least he's going to have to really confront that this time. And the good thing is that he would have had some experience with prior Robins. And for those of you who have read the Batman and Robin part of Grant Morrison's run, or even if you haven't, I understand that Dick Grayson takes up the mantle there and has Damien as his Robin living up to Batman's name, and that also allows them both to grow as characters immensely. Except the obvious thing here is I think Bruce will very much so be in the cave when Damien comes along, and it will be a journey of them bonding, each of them still very much so having their own flaws, learning to rely on one another, but yet also also growing in the same ways that Grayson and Damien do in the comic book run. So this is where I think putting that obvious plot aside and the things that we're expecting to see explored on the father and son side, this is where I really question what is going to be the antagonist slash villain of the movie. I do think that there is some natural things that I don't get why they would avoid it, and it'd be really cool to see in the Brave and the Bold movie, even if it's not, again, front and center as maybe it is in some of the issues in the source material. So for example, Talia. Talia Al Ghul. I'm not saying she's going to be the villain, but it'd be pretty natural to incorporate her as an issue in the movie, let's say. Not necessarily going full-blown Leviathan organization or anything like that, and where <laughs> she wants to completely dismantle and destroy Batman's life, but perhaps the very reason Damien gets dropped off initially to Bruce's doorstep is Talia's way of getting her claws stuck in once again. Talia is somewhat of a given for me with this movie because she can also be seen as a fairly crucial factor in showing Damien's development and possibly even his eventual rejection of Talia al Ghul's control. So you probably know where I'm going with this after somewhat bonding with his father in the movie. This could infuriate his mother with Damien defying her command, him maybe choosing to stay with Bruce by the end of the film after whatever plot takes place, maybe certain things that he learns about where he came from. Now I don't think she would go as far to completely reject Damien or even endanger his life like she goes on to do in Batman Inc. Even saying that there's dozens more waiting in their jars to be born at her command. But the thing is, what I've been talking about in this video so far is Bruce's ability to kind of maybe in the movie version be more of a good father than <laughs> perhaps what he was in the comics because by the end of Grant Morrison's Batman run, the way you can kind of look at it is that he still even after everything, quite simply struggled to be a good father to Damien. Not only Batman, but obviously Talia at the same time. And that's a major theme that's explored and where he just still ultimately doesn't put Batman aside, even if just sometimes, to be what Damien Wayne needs. And that's somewhat of a tragic theme that really does get explored there, especially with what ends up happening to Damien. So what I guess I'm trying to bring front and center here in this conversation is, I do wonder if they're going to make Bruce in this adaptation get even more vulnerable than what he is in the source material, because if they do that, Talia's cold approach in the movie could be a really, really useful mirror of tackling the contrast between where Damien comes from and where he could belong with his father, Batman, who along the way himself learns to be more embracing. Now, that's not me saying that we're not going to see scenes in The Brave and the Bold of Bruce uh, just dismissing Damien, being kind of not really cold himself, but Batman, but I, I do feel like maybe for the movie's sake, for more of a relatability to that of the audience, Bruce might open up a bit more. Like, the, the, the shell will be cracked more so than it is in the source material. And, and those of you who have read the run will kind of know what I mean by that. I'm not saying Bruce is an outright terrible father, I, I'm really not. But he, he is, his cornerstone, even above fatherhood, is still Batman. And I really, really am intrigued to see how that's tackled in the movie. And, and I would be willing to kind of low-key bet that they might try and blur those lines a little bit more so Bruce can be transformative himself in a way that he's never even evolved in before. Now, regardless of what direction they go there, and by the way, would absolutely love to know your thoughts on 
truly what take they'll do with Batman, you know, whether they do show a more sentimental relationship by the end of the movie, or if they choose another path of showing more subtle details of connection. It's still just a fascinating story to watch unfold. They're both far from simple characters, and just seeing them go on a journey and where Damien starts is not having empathy for killing, only to develop a conscience surrounding that. There's there's so much. <laughs> Again, I know some people are like, eh, DC Batman, I'm a bit appro I'm actually, for these reasons, especially diving even more into Grant Morrison's run recently, I'm like, damn, th this... You know, uh, we're used to seeing, for example, Matt Reeves' Batman recently, and that journey's going to continue. We've seen other iterations of Batman. But now we're going to see an iteration of Batman where I think, you know, Ben Affleck's Batman, we had a Batman further along, but there wasn't really the Bat family there. It wasn't conventional in the source material in that sense, even though it was really cool in other ways, like Dark Knight Returns vibes and stuff. But now we're seeing a Batman this far into his career with a Bat family, with Damian Wayne coming in, there's, there's so much untapped potential here we haven't really dived into in modern day cinema, if you will. And those of you who know, know what I mean by that. So we've just rambled about Talia a bit, how that can impact the relationship of, you know, Bruce, Damian, the development for Damian and the journey that go that happens there. What about... Raz al Ghul, or Raish al Ghul, or as I always like to go back to the Gotham days with David Mazus's Bruce, Raish al Ghul. Is he going to be around in this movie? Because when Talia al Ghul drops off Damien with Bruce, Raz al Ghul by that point is dead. Kind of. Like, the way, the way to look at him is that his spirit remains and he's trying to come back in somewhat of a Voldemort mode, having all the horror cruxes out there kind of thing. Once again, though, with adaptations not really being copy and paste, who knows what they could do here? That they could go with Raz being dead in Voldemort mode, seeking to come back and use his grandson as a host. Some of you may not know that. And I think that would be pretty damn cool. Again, they don't need to copy and paste everything, but I can really envision it in my mind with how the movie could somewhat pick up because the movie could pick up with the League of Assassins, right? Imagine this in your head, and Damien being taken to the Lazarus Pit with Talia, being deceived that he needs to help his grandfather be resurrected, but realizes in that moment, as well as Talia, realizing that he's about to be used as a host body, and so they escape. This leads Talia to drop him off with Batman, and Batman wasn't really aware that he had a son, and so the movie somewhat takes place there. You can imagine certain other things happening in the film, other little threats potentially uh, with the League of Assassins trying to resurrect Ra's al Ghul. We have white ghosts there. This forces Damien to be with his father and kind of see truly where he comes from and what it represents, what he was created for in, in a way, kind of, even though Talia doesn't agree with it. Um, and that makes him want to kind of shun the League of Assassins, but he's still very much so who he is, a killer. So he's forced to be with his dad. He doesn't really want to go back to the League or be with his grandfather necessarily, but he's also changing along the way in the movie to not be a killer, grow a bit more empathy, be connected to his father, which is also a difficult journey in of itself. Maybe see Tim Drake there, Dick Grayson there, and stuff like that. So not quite son of Batman in where, you know, I, I, it was it that Ra's al Ghul succumbed to some injuries and Damien enters the Batcave wanting to avenge Ra's al Ghul. There, there's, there's different takes out there, but this could be a cool way of doing it because it kind of just really shows the environment that gr Damien grew up in, in the League of Assassins with his bloody grandfather wanting to use his body as his new body, which is insane. But one thing is, I, I, the more I think about it, I really do want Ra's al Ghul involved. He doesn't have to be like, oh, you know, the comment of, oh, we saw Ra's al Ghul with Liam Neeson in Nolan's. I get what you're saying there, but like, it's also not the same thing. This is like a fantastical universe where there's a literal Lazarus pit. I, I'm not saying he has to be a main attraction. I think he can be involved with the, that of the larger world building and somewhat used as a springboard to get Damian Wayne to Gotham. Another approach to this is that they could have Ra's al Ghul alive at the beginning of the movie and also a part of the threat with Talia. And for all we know, since this is based off Morrison's Batman run, they could go uh, quite a different yet similar direction. Maybe Damien learns that he was intended to be the perfect host body for Ra's al Ghul because the Lazarus pit isn't working as it used to. It's not as effective as it once was. And again, he escapes and gets to know his father against his family's will, which then provides a bit of a threat from them pursuing him, Ra's, the League, Talia, but also some other bits and bobs in Gotham as well. You know, another thing is, I just, I don't feel like there's going to be 
that of this typical villain or antagonist in this movie, but maybe more of just this character study on the relationship between Batman at this point in his life and of course his son, how they both just navigate this relationship and what it brings out of both of them throughout the course of the movie. And as we know with James Gunn, albeit he's not, you know, directing this movie, Andy Muschietti is, he's still kind of like the Feige, right? He has these bullet points of what he wants in all of these movies. He plans this out with Peter Safran. He knows what he wants to be ticked off for the Brave and a Bold plot. Like, they have to meet his story beats there. And I can bet you, especially given the story this is surrounding, that he's going to want you to care about the characters. Characters are first. Not so much spectacle and action that comes second. Obviously, the movie needs to be entertaining, but just like his Guardians movies, even Peacemaker, you name it, you really care about those characters. You know James Gunn, he often can have the audience tearing up at several points in his movies. And sure, with other things, for example, like, of course, Joker is probably out there somewhere, maybe he's locked up at Arkham. The same would apply to most, if not all, of his rogues gallery, just having faced up against them at some point in time. And honestly, like, who knows what other fun villains we could get in The Brave and the Bold, with whatever Batman and Damian Wayne go up against as father and son. Like, I would genuinely love your input down in that comment section on which villains, if any, you would like to see Batman and Damien handle for a bit of father and son bonding time going out because don't forget he will take Damien on and probably as per what we can easily predict here go out on a night in the city probably a few nights because Damien is that trained killer he needs to teach him how to change from that and I think that will provide for some very entertaining scenes in the movie both fun but I'm sure some will be pretty damn shocking at the same time because obviously Batman has a very firm no killing rule and that is all Damien has known. So after a very long ramble guys I'm probably gonna leave this part here and expand more in the future so let me know if you'd like to see somewhat of a part two to envisioning Batman the Brave and the Bold in the DCU and what could come with that movie because I really do feel like I can expand on what I would like to see in areas that I didn't even touch on today such as the DCU's Batman Batsuit what I'd like to see that looking like the type of gadgets the Batcave and the other bucket list wishes for a new Batman but I just wanted to get down to the fundamentals and essence of what this movie will be so let me know what you think about what I said let me know what you think about the aspects of the father and son relationship there of course Batman's age and how that mirrors his progression of his vigilante career. Of course, the the adaptations or, you know, things you could draw influence from with Grant Morrison's comic book run. Do you think Ra's al Ghul should be involved? Do you think he should be dead at the beginning? Do you think that he should be alive? Do you think that should be the springboard of what causes Damien to be dropped off to Batman? Do you think Talia should do that? Or do you think Damien should escape independently? And so Talia and Raz both want the heir to the demon to um, go back to the League of Assassins. There's so many ideas, uh, but yeah, can't wait to see what you have to say. I read every single comment, so definitely leave them down in that comment section. I would also really appreciate a like on this video. Consider subscribing for more DCU content like this. But until next time, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day, and I'll see you, Bat Family, in the next video. Goodbye.